Good afternoon. Welcome to the 2020 Candidate Forum hosted by McMinnville Kiwanis Club. This event is only possible because of the generosity of the Bindery event space and McMinnville Community Media. Before we begin, I invite you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, Thank you. The McMinnville Kiwanis Club has been improving the lives of children in our community for decades. Each year we invest over $60,000 and countless volunteer hours into the youth of McMinnville. Most notably, we partnered with McMinnville Parks and Recreation to bring the first barrier-free park to Yamhill County. This is just one example of many that has made McMinnville a better place for kids. You can find more information on our Facebook page as well as our website. We are always looking for more members. Today, we are happy to continue a long-standing tradition of holding local candidate forums that focus on local issues and policy. Our first forum today features candidates for state representative, District 24, Ron Noble and Lynette Shaw. Thank you both for joining us here today. Each candidate will begin with an opening statement limited to three minutes. Each candidate will first have two minutes to answer a question, followed by a one minute response. Candidates will rotate answering first. If you are viewing virtually and wish to submit a question, you can send it via Facebook Instant Messenger to the McMinnville Kiwanis Foundation Facebook page. Please keep in mind that questions need to be directed to both candidates. Also, please keep your comments respectful and contribute to a conversation and not an attack on any candidate or commenter. McMinnville Community Media will be recording the event and airing it on their cable channels, as well as their YouTube channel. We will post links as soon as they are available. We will begin with opening statements. Candidates, you will stand at your microphone when it is your turn to speak. Please also keep an eye on our timekeeper to my right to ensure that you complete your statement before your time expires. Our timekeeper will alert you when you have 60 seconds remaining and then count down from there. Your time will start when you begin speaking. Ron, we will begin with your opening statement. You have three minutes. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Kiwanis, for uh, hosting this. Uh, in this time of COVID and everything going on, Forums and debates seem to be uh, few and far between. Uh, and, you know, quite honestly, it's, it's nice to be at least partially in person. I know there are a lot of people watching out there. So uh, thank you. And then thank you again for allowing me to be your state representative for the past four years and the two election cycles. It's an honor that uh, I don't take lightly, and it's a very important uh, job to represent you in Salem. Uh, as I mentioned, with COVID, campaigning looks totally different this year. Um, when you add in what's going on with COVID and healthcare, COVID and economic recovery, and then add wildfires to that, um, and the economic recovery and devastation that's happened. And then um, you may be aware of also some racial issues and police issues. Um, those things normally don't happen during a campaign season. So I've been busy working on your behalf, dealing with all of those issues. Um, today though, I, I expect as we move into campaign season, um, with just a little less than a week to go. Uh, you're going to hear today uh, some things that I believe have been misrepresentative, or, excuse me, misrepresented. You're gonna hear that Ron Noble doesn't care about climate change and doesn't believe that humans uh, cause climate change. In fact, that's not true. Uh, Ron Noble does believe that the climate's been changing since the creation of this earth and that humans do have an impact. Ron walked out because Ron didn't believe that was a solution, and Ron wanted the voters to vote on this issue. And I'd be glad to talk more, and probably will end up talking more about that today. You're going to hear that Ron doesn't care about health care, and that he voted no on a bill to increase taxes to medical providers and to increase taxes on your insurance premiums. Uh, that bill is not as simple as it sounds. I did vote no uh, because it would increase taxes, and we don't do budget bills normally in February. Those are done when we know what the revenue forecast is later in the year. But really what we have, we're in a situation now, not just what you're gonna hear about Ron. 
we have to choose how we're going to deal with issues that are coming forward. We have a recovery that we need to deal with in COVID. We have a health care issue and we have an economic issue. More important than that, we have actually family issues. The anxiety, the depression, and everything that people have set in over the last nine months is unreal. And we've experienced that here in Yamhill County. We're going to talk about uh, family recovery. We also need to talk about homeless issues. We need to talk about child abuse issues. We need to talk about addiction recovery issues. Those are all the issues that we will be taking up in this legislature in the next 21 session. So with that, I look forward today. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lynette, you have three minutes for your opening statement. Well, thank you to the Kiwanis, of course, for holding the forum, to the Bindery for offering the space, and to the audience for joining us today to find out more who, about who's asking for your vote. My name is Lynette Shaw. I'm a candidate for the Oregon House of Representatives in District 4, 24. I'm a small business owner from Carleton. I've got public health and science education and a healthcare background and 10 years of experience starting, running, and mentoring Main Street businesses. And I'm running for the seat because I believe the people of HD24 deserve a representative who will stay in the fight and deliver the help that we need to recover from our public health and economic crises. It's campaign season. And in this purple district, we hear a lot about bipartisanship and working with folks from across the aisle. And here's Salem's best kept secret. That's how it's done. That's how the vast majority of the bills get passed. That's how the vast majority of legislators work. Uh, it's just overwhelmingly bipartisan. So when we hear uh, our elected representative tell us that he just doesn't have a voice and that he just doesn't get fair treatment and that he had to walk out, that's demonstrably false. And one look at OLIS, the bill tracking system, will show just the opposite. There is negotiation. There are amendments. There is collaboration until there's not. And one group of representatives that claim bipartisanship will decide to walk away, leaving their colleagues holding the bag and leaving you, the constituents, without a voice in the legislature. And that is exactly why I'm standing here today, because our representative put his party above the people of District 24. And he said no to the most basic level of bipartisanship by fleeing the Capitol and shutting down the government. And our community loses in that scenario. We suffer real and tangible losses. Rural Oregonians have watched for years as stable manufacturing and natural resource jobs have departed. Healthcare coverage has grown more costly. Childcare resources have disappeared and wages have stagnated. At the start of 2020, unemployment was low, but if the only job around was barely above minimum wage and addiction and homelessness and now COVID was ravaging your community, it's hard to feel like everything's gonna be just great. So it's time to change that. And it's time to elect a representative that will show up to work for you. And I'm here to be that representative, not only by staying in the room and negotiate, but by doing the hard work for affordable and accessible health care, by standing up to drug companies and prioritizing mental health and addiction services, by showing up for our main street businesses and making sure our communities don't end up with a permanent landscape of big box stores and chain restaurants and for fighting for working families and kids to make sure they're not left behind in a recovery that has seen the greatest rise in economic inequality in decades. With so much at risk, the people of District 24 need, deserve to have their voice represented. Thank you. We're gonna move into our moderator questions. As a reminder, you will have two minutes each and then an additional one minute rebuttal. I am happy to repeat a question at any time. Ron, you will answer this question first. If elected, how will you represent the totality of your district? How do you plan to hear and respond to the concerns of constituents who may not have supported your campaign? Uh, thank you very much. I, you know, the, the word bipartisan gets tossed around a lot. The reality is, is we are there to represent the complete electorate in House District 24. And I'm just gonna give you some examples of what I've done in the past that will demonstrate my willingness to work across the aisle, um, as opposed to being represented by what I would consider mainstream Republican rhetoric. So um, most people are aware that there's an inclusionary zoning law in Oregon that really only applies to Portland. 
something that is absolutely a Democrat idea. But at the request of my constituents, I championed an inclusionary zoning law that was supposed to apply to McMinnville and allow a couple other cities. Unfortunately, after championing it through the House of Representatives, it made it to the Senate, where it was co-opted by another Democrat senator from Portland who wanted to actually provide an exemption for the requirements for exclusionary zoning in her district. So a Republican sponsoring a Democrat bill didn't sit well in the Senate. I have sponsored bills to deal with uh, forest spraying at the, um, well, actually the frustration of some of our forestry partners, simply because people in my district wanted that bill presented. I am very open. Last session, uh, I sponsored about 25 constituent bills, had success with about half of them, and champion what my constituents want from me in this district, representing you. So uh, I, I don't see it as a challenge if you're willing to listen, if you're willing to get a seat at the table and not just observe and understand the differences, but actually listen and, and actually understand what how people view different things so that you can sit at the table and come up with a solution. Thank you. Thank you. Lynette, same question goes to you. You have two minutes. Well, the first and most basic thing we have to do is to make sure that we're present to hear the concerns. Uh, staying in the conversation and not shutting it out completely by walking away is the place we have to start from. Frankly, I'd like to think that we're growing weary of putting everything that divides us ahead of our shared humanity uh, and our sense of community. I read an article the other day about the podcast Timber Wars, and they talked about this very thing, and I was really struck by how uh, doing their best to remove politics and historical baggage and quite simply recognizing the humanity, the fears and needs of folks who would it seem oppose you, it was possible for environmentalists and loggers in Grant County to find ways to work together to benefit everybody and to do it well. It's maybe just a version of the forgotten art of compromise uh, and when you know you're not, when you go in that you're not gonna get everything that you want, but when everyone acts in good faith with mutual and mutual benefit can be uh, reached. It would seem that the most direct way to avoid this type of dysfunction that we've seen in the past couple of years in Salem is by making sure all voices are represented at the table when negotiations are taking place. Negotiating in good faith, relying on experts and science for data to, to support those negotiations, and simple respect for people with experience and even goals that are different from your own. All of this can hopefully lead our community conversations and our legislature to being more willing to come together with policy aimed at making lives better for all Oregonians. Thank you. Ron, you have one minute to respond. You know, again, I, I guess I uh, made my, my comment, my introduction pretty clear that uh, we'll hear a lot about the walkout because that seems to be a recurring theme. Um, you know, being respected back and forth is, is actually a two-way street. And negotiation is something I've done uh, both as a union employee uh, and then as a manager. manager. And, and uh, trust built at the table is very important. The reason we walked out is because some progressives in Portland put pressure on the Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate, and the Governor, all with the supermajority and a fairly progressive Governor, and they're their questions are, is this the best you can do? They wanted to control it. The speaker knew all we had to do was refer this to the, people, the vote of the people, similar to what you were voting on now with measure 107 and 108. But she couldn't do that. And because of that, we lost a lot of other bills. That's just the beginning of where we have to start off as we move into next session. Thank you. Lynette, you have one minute if you wish to respond. We are going to hear a lot about the walkout, and that's just a, a fact. I, um, I wouldn't be here running against Ron if not for that walkout. I did not feel represented. And I think that uh, what I mentioned in my opening was that um, the stories of not having a voice and not being heard uh, really does not reflect the actual bipartisanship that happens on a regular basis in Salem. 
Um, and if there was difficulty with uh, a bill that was meant to address climate change, then I would have loved to have seen a bill presented by my opponent in the time that he's been in Salem and, and nothing had transpired. So saying no is the only thing you can do. That's what you got. Thank you. Lynette, you will answer this next question first. Forest management has been a hot button issue in recent years. What is your stance on managing Oregon's forests and other natural resources considering both economic and environmental impacts? Well, Forest management, <clears throat> forest management is an extremely complex issue. Um, and I don't think uh, it's something that can necessarily be resolved. And it's not, frankly, it's not my level, not my uh, place of expertise either, but it's not something that can be resolved in a forum like today, especially in two minute snippets. Um, but what I do know is that we live in, uh, we live in a community with competing values. Um, some of those values have very much to do with uh, economics and making sure that people continue to have good paying jobs. Some of those values have to do with keeping our landscapes green, keeping our forests whole, keeping our uh, environment sound. So for us to be able to balance those values is really what the key is in when we are looking at these really complex issues uh, and know that um, it's okay that we have competing values, and it's just like I talked about with the Timber Wars uh, podcast, those values compete, but it doesn't mean that uh, we can't resolve, if we approach things in a good, with good faith effort, it doesn't mean that we can't resolve our issues. Thank you. Ron, same question goes to you. You have two minutes. Thank you. This is a very timely question and something that's been in the news quite a bit lately with the tragic wildfires that we've had up the Sandy M Canyon and throughout the rest of the state. You know, as soon as that happened, um, the narrative changed to uh, climate control. And I'm going to tell you that climate control does have a lot to do with how our, managed, how our forests and, and burn. Um, but it's still a little bit premature to determine whether this is a climate control event, whether this is a forest management event, or whether this is a once every 50 year weather event. And I would propose to you that it's actually a combination of all of those. We need to do what we can to reduce our carbon output, to minimize our impact on climate change. Uh, solution, let's just set a cap, let's forget the trade part. But we also need then to allow people to go in and manage the forests, to clean up debris, to remove burned logs, to take care of what we've been given as far as resource, so that the next time there's less fuel. I know that fire takes heat, it takes fuel, and it takes oxygen. And if you remove one of those, you don't have fire. It's, it's simple science. So, and, and then we can't change the weather, but we can take action to minimize our impact on the environment and to maximize our ability to maintain those forests. Uh, I think that's where we need to head, and I hope that's what the discussion moving forward is, is to include both of those together. Thank you. Thank you. Lynette, you have one minute if you wish to respond. Um, I think that uh, the climate change issue is an important piece of this conversation. Um, but it is, uh, as Representative Noble noted, it is, is a very complex issue and it's a lot of uh, overlapping things. And um, it, it is uh, an issue that will only be solved when we look at all of the, uh, what the leading causes are and um, work together to resolve those leading causes. Thank you. Ron, you have one minute if you wish to respond. You know, only from the standpoint that some of the work that I've been uh, honored and blessed is being appointed by the governor to be the, the convener of the Mid-Valley Economic Recovery Team. And that specifically is dealing with the San Diego Canyon wildfire economic uh, work. Working with three counties, the county commissioners, business owners, uh, landlords, people who have been displaced by fire, to find a way to rebuild and get resources to the San Diego Canyon. Uh, 
one of those things I was appointed to do since the quote walkout, uh, which I think identifies some bipartisan effort and an ability to get re-engage even after one of the most difficult sessions that we've ever had in the legislature. I'm thankful to the governor for the opportunity. And then moving forward, look uh, to be able to assist in the recovery of the Sandy M Canyon devastation. Thank you. Ron, you will answer this next question first. Access to quality and affordable health care is important to the overall health and success of a community. How will you work to ensure that all constituents in your district have access to quality health care? And in your opinion, what are the biggest barriers to accessible and affordable health care? You have two minutes. So health care is very near and dear to me. Many of you may know or may not know that most of my family are health care providers. I was fortunate enough uh, prior to uh, Representative Greenlick's um, uh, departure from the legislature to be actually asked by him um, over a lunch to, to join his committee and be on the health care committee. And it, it, I found it to be fascinating in dealing with a uh, task force on health care cost reduction and accessibility, and then dealing with um, pharmaceutical transparency and trying to reduce the cost of pharmaceuticals. It is a critical critical thing that we make sure that everybody has access to affordable health care. The Health Care Cost Review Committee uh, right now is, is it, it evolved into Senate Bill 889 in the 2019 session, which convened a task force to look at ways to maximize, except put a cap on cost, um, cost increases for health care providers. That's something that is somewhat controversial because it would not allow costs for healthcare to go up by more than 3.4%. However, when you take into account all the things that cause in the backside from taxes to uh, other regulations that cause, and new technology and new research that cause the cost of healthcare to go up, we need to talk about a way to, and this, these are ongoing, this is as recent as last week in the discussion in, in the committee, we need to talk about ways to provide that health care, quality health care, affordable health care, accessible health care, and positive outcomes moving from a fee-based model to a quality management model. Uh, and that's, that's where we need to head, and that's where I know the health care committee is working right now, both in the Senate and the House. Thank you. Thank you. Lynette, you have two minutes to answer the same question. So, as you can imagine, healthcare is near and dear to my heart as well, and my, with my background. Um, and I think, with our prior to our per, current public health care crisis, our health care system that we had in place was inadequate to meet our needs. Uh, and we had a large percentage of our population that was technically covered, but we still saw too many young adults go without, and an increasing number of high premium and high deductible plans that led folks to delay care. Uh, and ration medications in an effort to stretch the health care dollars. Uh, my own family has done that, and I'm guessing most people's have as well. Uh, skyrocketing drug prices, persistent issues of access and affordability, especially in rural communities, uh, and inequity in delivery and disparities in outcomes really have been the norm. Uh, average costs of premiums and deductibles, deductibles have risen faster in the last decade than workers' ra wages have. So people who are working uh, are actually losing economic ground by taking part in the best possible coverage scenario. Uh, the walkout uh, in 2018 uh, killed the Drug Transparency Act. Um, excuse me, uh, it meant to study pharmaceutical practices and pricing and recommend next steps. The walkout also killed a bipartisan bill to cap ins insulin prices. Uh, and the walkout killed a bill to create community-driven organizations that work to serve historically underserved communities, and another to remove barriers to immigrants seeking health care. So these walkouts have prices to pay that, that it costs our community, it costs our community in health care, and it costs our community in access uh, to, to uh, accessible, excuse me, to affordable care. Thank you. Ron, you have one minute to respond. Uh, thank you. I, you know, the, the, uh, the walkout actually didn't do everything that was suggested. Um, 
The House Bill 4005, I was just uh, happy to join Representative Nose, uh, Senator Steiner Haywood, and Representative Linthicum as being one of the chief co-sponsors of the Drug Transparency Bill. Uh, what, was, what my opponent is, is brought up is actually the continuation of that task force that helped develop that bill to move on to other things. In the background, that's continued on as a work group. And the difference is that a task force is an official uh, body that gets compensated. A work group happens all the time, and it's legislators getting together who are involved and stakeholders to continue the work. However, uh, no, no outside compensation and no official committee. There's, there's a lot that we need to do with regard to healthcare, and I agree with many of what my, my opponent says. Right now, CCO's patient increase is 10% because we are losing jobs and we're losing private insurance. We need to move forward. Thank you. Lynette, you have one minute to respond. All right, then we can switch from talking about the walkout to talking about votes. Um, in 2019, my opponent voted uh, against fully funding the Oregon Health Plan, and that plan covers 1.1 million Oregonians, including hundreds of thousands of low and moderate income kids. Voted no on a bill directing the OHA to provide a forum for collaboration to design health care delivery system for Oregon's future. Voted no on a bill to create a task force for universal health care uh, to explore providing a public option. Look, I think. Uh, we have to start addressing uh, things like the, the costly social determinants of health, and we have to start taking a more of a public health look at how we deliver health care in our, in our communities. Um, and when we start looking at uh, the quality of our schooling, the safety of our workplaces, the cleanliness of water and air, and how that affects people's health, uh, then we can start to address the determinants that drive 80 to 90 percent of the health care outcomes could only use 10% of the targeted funding. Thank you. Lynette, you will answer this question first. Drug addiction and mental health issues are on the rise both locally and nationally. How does Oregon develop to provide paths to recovery and treatment? Additionally, how should Oregon fund addiction and mental behavioral health services? You have two minutes. So there are a lot of models out there for addiction treatment, and there are a lot of um, avenues to fund them. But one thing we can't do when funding behavioral health care treatments is to throw money away, which is exactly what was done with a $46 million federal grant that was funded, that funded a comprehensive community behavioral health clinic through Yamhill County HHS. We lost that money, all of it. And we lost our innovative and effective program that, along, along with it because Representative Noble shut down our government with the walkout in February. And that's the real cost that I'm talking about. That's the cost of political games in Salem. We had been running this program using a model that's widely seen in, in addiction treatment as one of the most effective and efficient out there. It included 24-hour crisis care, tailored care for active duty military and veterans. The program represented the largest investment in mental health and addiction care in generations. And we were one of only eight communities in the nation to have one. And it simply breaks my heart that we lost this resource. The, these comprehensive style delivery system clinics really are the best way forward, and I intend to fight to get that back. Funding that sort of work is a challenge, but this model addressed the financing barriers. They were specifically designed to address funding shortfalls by paying clinics a Medicaid rate that included anticipated costs and using a projected payments, a prospective payment system, similar to the one that's in place for other safety net providers. This is the value-based delivery system that I would fight for in physical health care as well. Thank you. Ron, same question goes to you. You have two minutes. Well, I'm glad to hear that, that both of us up here agree that we need to do, move to a managed care model as opposed to fee-for-service, because that's what the legislature's been working on for the last several years. The, I'll just say this about the walkout again, it came up. Um, it's lost on people sometimes that the Republicans actually offered to come back on Friday before the end of the session to pass these types of bills that I supported in committee. Uh, but the person in control said no, uh, because of the politics that go on in Salem. 
there is a huge need in our society, even in this community right here, for greater assistance and greater funding for addiction recovery and behavioral health issues. That's never been a question. The question is why the majority party fails to fund them. It's not because of a lack of bipartisan effort, because I've been working with my colleagues, the other, uh, as vice chair, working with the chair and the other vice chair of the Human Services Committee, where all of this stuff comes together to encourage more investment in these issues as well as housing and homelessness. The, the problem is most of Salem legislature are afraid to choose and actually prioritize something that is going to have to happen this next legislative session. We need to support Oregon Recovers. We need to support Rally Oregon. We need to support Provoking Hope. We need to support Champion Team. And then the other thing we need to do, both for addiction recovery counselors and for behavioral health issues, is talk about pay equity and parity along with uh, medical health uh, pay for behavioral health and addiction recovery pay because right now it's not there and insurance doesn't reimburse and pay for those services like it needs to. Those are issues that actually have been discussed during our committee meetings and where we're headed this next year in health care and human services. Thank you. Lynette, you have one minute to respond. I think it's really important that we not ignore the loss of this community behavioral health clinic um, and the loss of this $46 million federal matching grant. Uh, this, is, this is a huge loss to our community and we, have, we are now flat footed in how we respond to that. So yes, having other, uh, other supports to the community is very, very important and, and I would advocate for those as well. Uh, and maybe the, uh, the advantage of electing a Democrat to this, to this seat is that we uh, have somebody that works within the caucus that's in power to be able to make those changes. Thank you. Ron, you have one minute to respond. Senate Bill 1530, again, just the reason we walked out, provided the greatest change to Oregon's working families and Oregon's economic system. It deserved the vote of the people. And I agree that this other legislation, along with many others, including supportive housing in McMinnville, should have passed. I'm disappointed in the, in the leadership that they weren't willing to come back together on the two days we offered to come back together and take care of our constituents and take care of our people. Thank you. Ron, you will answer this next question first. A yes vote on Measure 107 would change the face of political campaigns in Oregon. Currently, Oregon is only one of five states with no limits on campaign contributions. In your opinion, what are the pros and cons of campaign finance limitations and required contributor disclosures? You have two minutes. Campaign finance in Oregon is out of control. All you have to do look, is look right here in this district. In 2016, in order to represent just under 70,000 people, my opponent and I spent a million dollars. And when you add to that another half to three quarters of a million by outside interests, it's almost a $2 million race. This year is also very expensive. It's not to that level, but it's extremely expensive. In House District 54, both candidates have raised over a million dollars, which makes it an over $2 million race. So when you talk about the extra money spent by third party interests, it's probably closer to $3 million. I absolutely support Measure 107, but I have some concerns because you asked for both the pros and cons. The cons, I see third party interests taking over the campaigns. As an example, my opponents had mailers sent out by, or I don't know if she's had them sent out, but the Democratic Party of Oregon and then other organizations have actually sent stuff on her behalf. I see that happening more often without the candidate having any control. That's not a positive. I actually turned away $25,000 because someone wanted to do a negative piece. And I said, we don't do that. So there's, there are pros and cons. We need to get the money out of politics. We need to be able to do more of this. We need to be careful how we move along and who we give the power to to sway and make the argument. I mentioned before, traditional Republican rhetoric, which doesn't apply to me. There's plenty of examples where I've left my party to vote on driver's license for, 
for everybody in Oregon or to vote on reducing uh, the death penalty. But that's not what comes up because it is outside interests that come with just stereotypical rhetoric. We need to reduce the cost of elections. Thank you. Lynette, same question goes to you. You have two minutes. Uh, first, I want to be clear that Measure 107 won't enact limits, but it will guarantee that limits can be adopted and not hindered by lawsuits, which is really what happened after limits were initially approved in 2006 by voters. The voters have already weighed in on this once and is with very clear intentions to limit campaign contributions. And I'm really surprised to hear my opponent say that he is supporting of a 107 because his votes indicate otherwise. So unlike my opponent, I would say I would support the voters and I want their voice to be heard. We're 27th largest state in the country by population and we rank number one in terms of cash given to individual lawmakers. And when we ask lawmakers, does that cash influence your legislating, politicians themselves admit that money buys lobbyists favorable policy. Corporate lobbyists dole out the checks and legislators respond with policy that benefits corporations and disadvantages small businesses and hardworking Oregonians. That, here's the kind of money that we're talking about. In the last two months, Ron brought in over $286,000 in two months. That's money from insurance, drug and tobacco companies, corporate and political PACs, all of whom now want favors. In contrast, my campaign raised just over $137,000 in total with the vast majority coming from individual people and zero coming from corporate dollars. And I honestly cannot think of any cons to this. And my position really is in stark contrast to my opponent who already voted no on bills to enact limits and voted against modest reform in reporting dark money. He couldn't even be bothered to show up to vote on the bill that to refer 107 to the ballot. So unlike Ron, I'm 100% in favor of limiting contributions to politicians. Thank you. Ron, you have one minute to respond. Yeah, I'm not sure how showing up deals with 107 since that was referred during the 2019 session uh, and not the 2020 session. But, but I will vote no if it's unconstitutional. And the Supreme Court ruled that the limits were unconstitutional. 107 is a referral from the legislature, just like Senate Bill 1530 should be, so that people can decide and change the Constitution and make the laws. We have we have a situation where right now, um, based on labor and, collect and uh, unions, Democrats have about $6 million to spend on legislative races, and Republicans have about $3 million to spend on legislative races. There is a politics within politics in campaigning, and I can tell you I hate to campaign because we will try to get people to do different things based on where money goes. As far as politicians, voting the way people want them to do. I'm gonna suggest one. Bankers are not happy because I suggested in the special session that we give a relief for mortgages. And home builders and realtors are not happy because I put forth what I said before, inclusionary zoning in McMinnville. I don't vote based on money. I vote based on what you need. Thank you. When I, you now have one minute to respond. Keeping money out of Oregon politics that is completely saturated with money right now and, you know, to, um, it is just, it, it's just not true that uh, there is more money on Democrat side than there is on the Republican side, as we've seen in the numbers for this race right here. And what we see when we have unlimited funds is you see hurdles that are presented for good people from the community that cannot get in and compete because their incumbent opponents have corporations that have funded them up to their eyeballs. And there's no way for folks to get in to compete with that. So it puts politicians in power and it doesn't put people in power. And we need, we need people who are representing us who are responsive to people, not to corporations. Thank you. Lynette, you'll answer our final question first. How will you advocate for children and youth? And this is gonna be a jam-packed question. The COVID-19 pandemic has worsened the gap between those more fortunate and those most at risk. How will you ensure that you provide a safety net of care to everyone, especially the most vulnerable 
and families with children. I think uh, I touched on this a little bit initially in my opening statement and talking about how uh, this pandemic has given rise to what we've seen as the most dramatic change in uh, equity and economic equity and economic um, parity in in our community in decades. We've never seen anything quite like this. Uh, so, you know, it is it is my intention to focus all policy and to focus um, all actions w through a lens of making sure that we're not leaving people behind. We have, particularly right now, we have women who are leaving their careers because they can't find affordable ch child care or can't find any child care uh, right now. And we have to respond to that. We have to uh, not lose women from our workforce and we have to make sure that our kids get access to the edu quality education that they deserve so that they can achieve what we want them to achieve. Uh, we need somebody that can support all of these things uh, and who will uh, guarantee that they'll be looking through that lens of justice and equity uh, when we go and, and start to talk about policy. Thank you. Ron, same question goes to you. You have two minutes. There's a lot of things that we do in government that are important, but I can tell you that my whole life is committed to public safety. My legislative work is committed to um, really trying to deal with some of the issues that we face in society and move past that and beyond that. We need to invest in our children because maybe if we do that, we may be down the road a couple generations where law enforcement's not necessary. Or maybe some of the issues we face today and our struggle with will be solved. If we don't put adequate resources into their well-being, we fail. Now, I know that there's been some controversy over the um, uh, Student Success Act. It's a great name, but really it's a commercial activities tax. And I'm going to say this because I know my opponent will bring it up. What we have seen, and even the Senate president said, we will take general fund money from the schools when this goes in place. We will take, in Measure 110, marijuana money that goes to the schools and give it somewhere else because we have student success money. What you don't, people don't realize always is that legislatures are not bound in future years. It's very easy for the legislature in 2021 to come in and sweep money from the Student Success Act to put somewhere else. Now, specifically children, I've had, I've got grandchildren, I've got children, I've watched, my wife works in the schools with, with children with disabilities. We need to ensure during this time of COVID uncertainty, especially in this community where we've seen it, that our children have a way and a path forward. The Oregon economist even told the governor that our response to COVID has had a desperate, disparate impact and we've created a middle class and upper middle class and a farther separation between our working families. That also applies to racial equity and then children. Thank you. Lynette, you have one minute to respond. So yes, thank you for bringing up this, the Student Success Act. Um, the Student Success Act that we saw from headlines last week, week before, brought $1.7 million to McMinnville School District. That's during a year when, and, that, and it's funding very critical, critical uh, issues that we talked about that both of us value here today. So, and, and we, that's during a year when we are, uh, have very low tax revenues and during a year during, uh, when we're experiencing a pandemic. And Yamhill Carlton is somewhere around $540,000 this year. So the Student Success Act, if you value children, then that means that you value a stable funding for education. Uh, and this is the only time that we have really achieved that baseline of stable funding for public education in Oregon. So, and Ron did not vote for that. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we, we need somebody who will show up and support our kids. Thank you. Ron, you have one minute to respond. No, absolutely, I did not vote because it's not stable. That's the whole point, is that the funding can be taken at any time. There's nothing in the act that actually requires it to go to schools. 
In fact, that's why well, we were especially concerned about the Senate President's comment before the bill was passed that he was going to take money. The other thing is that the Student Success Act, the Capital Activities Tax, did not fund the quality education model that Oregon's been trying and been chasing for the last decade and a half. Instead, we have all types of small programs, all very wealth, worthwhile, all very valuable, but we didn't put any funding into our basic, basic need to fund the quality education model. I see that, um, and I, I'm very grateful for the money that's come out of, of that to go to students, but I, I'm skeptical as to whether it's gonna stay, and I'm skeptical as to whether or not we're actually doing our students right by the way it's being used. Thank you. All right, we are moving into our closing statements. Candidates, you will each have three minutes. Ron, we'll begin with you. So you have three minutes for your closing statement. Thank you. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today uh, to talk about uh, such really an important issue and how we can best represent your issues, your needs in Salem. Uh, there has been a lot of talk about um, some, some pretty critical issues, health care, child welfare, uh, mental health, uh, behavioral health, addiction recovery. Uh, I've been fortunate, and I say fortunate because most people are on three committees. I've been fortunate to be selected and appointed by the Speaker of the House to eight committees right now. And I'm on a dozen or so, excuse me, half a dozen or so task forces. Many of them deal with these issues, from the, the work group on decriminalizing mental illness, working for uh, justice, uh, restorative justice, working towards child abuse and welfare. Uh, one of the, the, during a walkout, I actually was excused because I was at an organization receiving an award from our child abuse investigators as, as a champion uh, against child abuse. And I guess I would just say this, my experience in the legislature really mirrors my experience of being a, what a, a good street cop needs to be. And, and let me explain this. To do a good job, I think we would all agree an officer needs to step back and try as best they can to understand, not just see the difference, but actually understand and try to best view how someone else is looking at an issue. Try to, as best they can, listen, and understand the lens that they may be observing whatever circumstance. And that's what it's like in the legislature. To be effective, you need to actually listen. And you need to understand that Diego Hernandez's ex experience in Northeast Portland is different than Ron Noble's experience. Yet we can come together and provide a solution that provides safer schools and champion a, a bill. That Rob Nose's experience in the other side of Portland is different than Ron Noble's experience. Yet we can come together and talk about pharmaceutical transparency and reducing the cost of, of pharmaceuticals. The Mitch Greenlick, who is a, a push for universal health care and a constitutional right, and Ron Noble have completely different ideas, but we can come together and talk about affordable health care, access to health care, and ensuring your safety. That's what I do. And I could give you a lot more examples places where I've failed, places where we've been successful, but my job is to represent you. There's been reference to a purple district. One of the joys is of, of representing a swing district is that you can connect with everybody on something. One of the hard parts is, it doesn't matter what you decide, somebody is going to be upset. And that's the idea of a diverse district and a bipartisan uh, purple district. Thank you. Lynette, you now have three minutes for your closing statement. So thank you again, Kiwanis and Representative Noble, and to the viewers. I'd like to take the opportunity to speak directly to those voters who are still undecided and who haven't yet turned in their ballots. I'm in this race to offer you a choice in how you're represented and an opportunity for changing the narrative and how we deal with disagreements in policymaking at the Capitol. I believe that disagreements are worked through by staying at the table and representing the interests of my community. Our current representative thinks those disagreements are solved by threats of shutting down the government. <clears throat> he walked out on his job, he walked out on his colleagues, and he walked out on us. 
because his party told him to. And he won't commit to not doing it again. You don't get to do that and then claim you're bipartisan. With bipartisanship, the price of entry is to stay in your seat and do the hard work of legislating. We don't owe this position to a representative who won't show up for us. We've seen it here today that our community loses when our representative shuts down government for political gain. And we are at real risk if our elected officials behave that way. Governing by not governing is not the answer. Just look around at what happened with the pandemic and our economic crash with wildfires and smoke debilitating our communities and our small businesses. And it's easy to see that the people of Oregon pay a terrible price when our legislature is put into chaos by political stunts and neglects to pass legislation to protect us. We don't need political games. We need good governance. Our lives and our livelihoods depend on it. And if I'm elected, I'm committed to staying in Salem and representing all constituents by negotiating and working together with legislators and the public, regardless of party of affiliation. It's what I do in my small business, and it's what I'll do in Salem. When we have a representative that will be a real voice for us, we can absolutely move toward fairness in how we deliver health care and protect the people of our communities. We can create health policy that prioritizes early intervention and improves care for veterans and diverts those struggling with mental health issues away from involvement with police and the justice system. We can help our small businesses by employing creative solutions to build resiliency and find collaborations and new ways to source capital and lower the barriers to doing business in our communities. We can have stable and appropriately funded public education that will set up our kids for the successful future that we want for them. And we can have a representative that believes that the climate crisis is real and deserves action. And that listens to science, scientists and it, when making legislation. We can have those things, but we just have to want it bad enough to elect legislators who are willing to fight for it. And I'm running that, this race to be that legislator and I'm asking for your vote to help me get there. Thank you. Ron Noble and Lynette Shaw, thank you both for a productive conversation. The recorded version of this forum will be available by McMinnville Community Media on their cable channels and YouTube. We will be posting links to our Facebook page and club website as soon as they are available. Our website is www.mcminnvillekiwanis.org. I'd like to remind you that today, Wednesday, October 28th, is the last day ballots can be mailed. After this date, you should put your ballots into a drop box. There are 15 locations across the county. Thank you all for joining us virtually. Our next forum. <laughs>